Good morning, folks. Thank you for joining me today for our splendid little history at home talk about South Carolina in the Spanish-American War. Uh, this is Joe Long, the education curator, and I'm at the South Carolina Confederate Relic Room and Military Museum this morning. And we do appreciate your investing a little time with us. I have some great images and close-ups of a couple really interesting artifacts to show with you all today. And I think a theme that we have a lot to learn from. Uh, and behind me here, you can see our case in the gallery, which is now open. So come and see us at your earliest opportunity. A case about that conflict in the late 19th century. Part of what happens in that conflict, uh, in the historiography of our own museum, is that this is the point at which the Confederate Relic Room's mission grows. We get questions at times. Uh, folks come, come in and they see a name related to the war war in the 1860s and they say, why does your Confederate relic room have things in it that are evidently 20th century that come from other conflicts and not that war between the North and the South? Uh, and, you know, when did the mission grow to be what it is today? And of course, our mission today is South Carolina military history throughout the state's history. Well, the ladies who began our museum in 1896, these ladies intended to preserve their own history and that of their husbands, their cousins, their brothers who had fought in active service. And these were ladies who saw their sons, their nephews, the boys from their Sunday school classes grow up and go to the Spanish-American War just two years after the museum was opened. And so they saw this as a connected story. And there are a lot of good reasons to consider it a connected story. There are a lot of good reasons to think of the Spanish-American War as a real uh, reunion moment in American history, a, a practical reconciliation uh, carried out by fighting on the same side on the battlefield. And this is reflected as well in the Relic Room's coverage of this conflict in the 1890s. And by the way, one of my favorite bits here as we stand in the gallery, we're gonna look at some original images today. We're going to look at some artifacts today that are back in the prep room, not on display. But when you come into the gallery here, definitely one of my favorites since I'm a sword guy, and this may be one of the most beautiful swords in the collection. This is a presentation sword given to Lieutenant J.S. Cochran. And this sword is a gift from it is as it is engraved on the scabbard and the engraving on the scabbard is really quite beautiful. Y'all come in and see it when you can. From the citizens of Abbeville, South Carolina to the Abbeville Volunteers, Company A, 1st Regiment, South Carolina. And these soldiers who almost universally had fathers who fought in the Confederate Army, the name of every soldier in the entire company is engraved along the blade of Lieutenant J.S. Cochran's sword. Just tremendous work. If you did that today, uh, a presentation sword for an officer uh, might not be that expensive, but that amount of engraving would cost far more than the item itself. And here, by the way, we have the same man's, one of the same man's uniforms on display. And we see here, Lieutenant Cochran in the field. He's got a little bit of uh, whiskers on his chin there. He's been living in the field. He hasn't been shaving, but he is carrying that beautiful presentation sword. 
So let's look a little bit at the background of what's going on in the Spanish-American War in 1896 uh, and some terrific images, most of which are from the collection of photographs of that same officer, J.S. Cochran. Couple of beauties right here. These are not from Cochran's collection. Uh, but we have on display the pistol used in Confederate service of General Matthew Colbraith Butler, Wade Hampton's right-hand man. You see here a photograph uh, in a West Point uniform of his son. Uh, and M.C. Butler Jr. is going to serve on M.C. Butler Sr.'s staff during the Spanish-American War. Uh, and that's really a remarkable story. Uh, as you'll see a little bit later, another Confederate officer distinguished in the Carolinas campaign of 1865 with his name well known in South Carolina uh, and General Fighting Joe Wheeler becomes a United States general 30 years later for the Spanish-American War. And when he does so, Matthew Colbraith Butler, who had fought alongside him and often with a certain amount of friction with him, uh, a rival, uh, also became a United States officer, despite the fact that Matthew Colbraith Butler Sr. had lost a foot to cannon fire in 1863. So an officer with a wooden foot returned to active service and both men brought with him their sons, uh, brought with them their sons to serve on their staff, both of their sons, um, Wheeler's boy, as well as M.C. Butler's, were West Point graduates. So one thing that's being illustrated already in the Spanish-American War here is a reconciliation theme that prominent Confederate officers and partisan Democrats, both Wheeler and Matthew Colbert Butler, had careers as Democratic legislators uh, and congressmen uh, and senator. Uh, that they had proudly sent their sons to West Point to be part of the United States Army that they had actually fought against in the 1860s, uh, and that the reconciliation process went so far that both men served in blue uniforms in the Spanish-American War and brought their sons with them, which is worthy of a salute from Theodore Roosevelt. And we've got a picture here of Theodore Roosevelt in some Spanish-American War commemorative events going on in Charleston shortly after. So what is going on? What causes this tremendous transformation? Remember that in the 1860s, South Carolina had had 60,000 free men of military age in the whole state and yet during the war had sent more than 63,000 men into service, uh, a really a full commitment as far as that's possible of the, of the eligible population to fight in the war in the 1860s uh, for the Confederacy. And that 21,000 of those men never returned, more than one in three were lost. So, that left, of course, a, a deep scar and is not the kind of thing historically you would think would lead to reconciliation. Certainly not the kind of thing historically you would usually think, oh, well, these men's sons are going to volunteer in large numbers, eager to fight in blue uniforms under the United States flag. And yet they did. Uh, and by the way, there's some great details in this picture here. Uh, you can see the rifles, the upgrade here, as well as the cartridge belts that go with them. He's got a bayonet at his side here. The campaign hat, which I was wearing a reproduction example of as I started this talk. The 
khaki trousers suitable for the tropics, the blue wool battle shirt, not at all suitable for the tropics. And yet, uh, what these men are actually going to wear in Cuba. Well, Cuba, it just so happened, was the point of origin of the family that ran the state newspaper here in Columbia, South Carolina in the late 1800s. Uh, in fact, the Gonzalez brothers, their father had been a Spanish officer in Cuba, had been a critic of the Spanish government, had actually resigned and left and came to South Carolina where he fit quickly in high Charleston society. He was a bit of a Spanish aristocrat and, and someone that was very popular in Charleston. He became a colonel in the Confederate Army after secession. And his boys grew up to be journalists and run the state newspaper. And for many years had been advocating that the United States get involved and do something about the situation in Cuba. So one part of the eagerness of South Carolinians to sign up and fight in this cause in 1898 was simply the fact that the Gonzalez brothers had been keeping the issue of Cuba and of Spain's mistreatment of the inhabitants of Cuba very prominent in their paper for a very long time. One of the Gonzalez brothers published a book as well, a book called In Darkest Cuba, which uh, was a sort of um, quasi behind the Iron Curtain look uh, sort of of Spanish mismanagement and cruelty there. These are members of the generation right after the war generation in the 1860s. And that's a critical part of the South Carolina story in the Spanish-American War, because it's a matter of coming to terms with the very, very much admired military legacy of the Southern soldier from South Carolina fighting in the 1860s. And his son, what is his son going to do? What is his daughter's opinion going to be about a United States war in a country that had now come together again. Uh, and a couple, these are both just great period pictures. We saw J.S. Cochran in his lieutenant's uniform a little while ago. He's the man who is awarded the magnificent sword in Abbeville. This is his other uniform. Look at the glove on his hip here. This is perhaps one reason that he was uh, such a local hero in Abbeville, South Carolina. It certainly didn't hurt his reputation. Uh, we Southerners do love an athlete and he is a semi-professional baseball player. And this is a photograph in his baseball uniform. Uh, this is his wife over on the left. The battleship Maine, if you are going to answer questions on a quiz show about the Spanish-American War, there are going to be basically two answers. Uh, the, the quiz show answers on the Spanish-American War are one of two things, the Battleship Maine, or the other quiz show answer is uh, San Juan Hill, or the Rough Riders at San Juan Hill. Those are the two incidents of that war that uh, sort of stick in pop culture memory. Uh, of course, the first is the spark, the one that sets off the war. Uh, and by the way, it seems that pop culture reduces every war, no matter how vast and complicated, to two things. Um, the opening of the war, the incident thought to start the war, and the so-called turning point, the climax the dramatic climax of the war. Uh, if people know only two things about a fight, they know those two things, and those two things are often wrong. For instance, uh, World War II, people know Pearl Harbor and D-Day. Uh, but of course, Pearl Harbor happened to bring us into a war that had already been going on for years. 
Uh, so that's an example of oversimplification. Indeed, American forces were helping against the German U-boats before Pearl Harbor happened. Well, in the case of the Spanish-American War, the destruction of the battleship Maine, what folks know about that, if they've looked into it at all, is that this United States battleship in Havana Harbor blew up. We declared war and rushed in and have since learned that it's very unlikely that the Spanish blew up the Maine. In fact, it wouldn't have made a great deal of sense for the Spanish to blow up the Maine in the first place. And one conspiracy theory held that the insurrectionists blew up the Maine, hoping we would think it was the Spanish and come in on their side. The best theory is that the Maine was destroyed by an accidental explosion. It didn't matter. Well, why didn't it matter? Not because we're crazy warmongers or we're in 1898, but rather because tensions were already so high. And the Maine had been sent to Havana Harbor in the first place to send a clear message to the Spanish. Uh, it is really no surprise that the reaction to the destruction of the Maine was a declaration of war, which some had been agitating for for, for a long time. So recruiting Southern soldiers is now gonna be a big part of what the US Army is doing. You see a great, um, for Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, it says. One effect of the Spanish-American War would be the United States acquisition of the Philippines. And that had some long-term implications. Recruiting Southern soldiers was not hard. A lot of concern about that from people outside of our region who wondered about the loyalty of these troops and whether they would be eager to fight. Southern culture is pretty good at producing folks who are eager to fight. And to fight, in this case, with the blessing of the previous generation. One exception was the state's great military leader and former governor and Senator Wade Hampton. Wade Hampton was a strong critic of the Spanish-American War, which he considered to be an aggressive war to seize territory, not the sort of thing that he thought Americans ought to do. However, Wade had also been very dubious about secession by all accounts. Certainly he didn't sign the secession ordinance. And yet when his home state went to war, he believed it was his duty to go. Well, this did not change with the Spanish-American War. He was asked by a newspaper reporter about Congress's declaration of war, uh, having uh, been known to be a critic and said we should not go to war with Spain. Uh, they came to get the grand old man of the state's opinion now. And Wade Hampton said roughly, you all know what I think of this war, but you also know that South Carolina has been asked for volunteers. And if South Carolina falls one man short in that quota, I can still ride a horse and swing a sword, and I will be there myself. Uh, this is a bit of bravado from Wade, who's an older man, but it made his point of view clear. And he did help his right-hand man, Matthew Colbraith Butler, who was a good deal younger, to secure a commission in United States forces uh, and go off to serve in Cuba. The men of South Carolina who left with South Carolina's militia units for the Spanish-American War would, in many cases, wind up serving under General Lee, not General Robert E. Lee, the sort of patron saint of uh, Southern military valor, but rather his nephew, General Fitzhugh Lee. 
But General Fitzhugh Lee was a former Confederate general in his own right, and the fact that he would be uh, the commander of the occupation forces was something that was not lost upon these men and that they took great pride in. It was a lot of fun to write on a postcard back home that you were serving with General Lee. He also won the hearts of the South Carolina troops um, by both paying a compliment and doing them a, a good turn recreationally. Uh, the story was told that uh, some officers came to General Fitzhugh Lee with a recommendation. Uh, there was a tavern near the South Carolina encampment area and uh, they came to Fitzhugh Lee and said, sir, uh, the South Carolinians have a tavern near them and accessible to their camp and you need to close that tavern because you know those boys, they will pick a fight with a circular saw if they get some liquor in them. Well, General Fitzhugh Lee replied, yes, you're correct, I do know those boys. I served in the Army of Northern Virginia with their fathers, and let me tell you, they will pick a fight with a circular saw, drunk or sober, might as well leave the tavern open. Uh, so both for the compliment uh, and for keeping the tavern open, he won the affection of the men assigned to him. Now some images here uh, from the time. Look at the collars each time because some of them say SC for South Carolina with the cross rifles. Others uh, say USV for United States Volunteers. You'll also see Spanish-American War is just a magnificent era for whiskers, uh, maybe the most wonderfully bewhiskered period of our history. And here is Joe Wheeler himself. Now, Joseph Wheeler in 1865 was a very young cavalry general. And his troops actually burned the bridges across the Congaree River to slow down the advance of Sherman's troops. They would have passed right in front of the building where I'm sitting right now. General Lee's, our General Wheeler's cavalry were the victors at the Battle of Aiken, site of the popular reenactment every year in South Carolina. Uh, and he was a guy whose name was well known and thought of very affectionately in this state, as well as across the border in Augusta, Georgia, his original hometown. Well, General Joe Wheeler went to President McKinley to volunteer his services for the Spanish-American War. And President McKinley knew a good thing when he saw it. It would be wonderful to have a former Confederate general as sort of a rallying point for the men of the South to sign up for this new conflict. So he was eager to bring Joe Wheeler on board. Uh, and so I, We'll be happy to commission you and you can travel around and give speeches uh, and, and build up support for the war. And Joe Wheeler said, no, Mr. President, you misunderstand me. I desire command of the cavalry in the field. Uh, and he wouldn't accept command under any other conditions than that he actually lead troops in combat. Now, by this time in his life, uh, General Wheeler's not a tall man. One of his men wrote that he was, um, five foot two and 120 pounds with a rock in each pocket and his hair combed down wet. So not a very big guy and with his Spanish-American War period beard, he looked increasingly like a gnome. But the truth is he was a terrific commander in Cuba, uh, taking a good deal of initiative, sometimes um, second guessing is his own rather cautious commander, General Shafter. General Shafter can be thought of as the McClellan of the Spanish-American War. He wished to get all the logistics in line and move very gradually. Uh, Joe Wheeler had dealt with commanders like that before, uh, did not approve, and believed in securing the victory swiftly, and he did a lot to make that happen. Uh, it's worth reading about his role but everybody's favorite story about Joe Wheeler had less to do with his great tactical 
proficiency or his strategic thought or even the self-sacrifice that he showed uh, when he uh, gave up his seat uh, for wounded men, but rather with a side effect of the malaria that he picked up in Cuba, as well as his age. Uh, Joe Wheeler was engaged at a place called Las Guasimas, and at Las Guasimas, his cavalry soldiers uh, were firing at the Spanish. The Spanish light had broken. They were in retreat, and Joe Wheeler was heard to shout, would you look at them blamed Yankees run? Well, this became a story in the New York Times, not a controversial one, but more of a lovable foible kind of story. Former Confederate forgets which war he's fighting. Uh, this story comes to us from various directions. Uh, the, the quote is slightly different here and there, and Wheeler himself made a quote about the quote when he was asked by a reporter, did you really say, would you look at those damned Yankees run? Joe Wheeler replied, no son, I did not, I never curse. Here's a picture of another South Carolina volunteer from Abbeville, Captain Claude Sawyer of the 1st South Carolina Volunteer Infantry. Look at his neck here. First of all, they all have these disposable collars, which are worn in a variety of styles. Let's look back. Collar worn in a slightly different style there, but also a different collar device. He's got US volunteers rather than SC for South Carolina on his. And another way to wear that disposable collar, as well as we're back to South Carolina on his collar device, Lieutenant Glenn. Also pretty good whiskers. Wyatt Aiken, the battalion adjutant. And that's what this device here indicates. And if you get close to the insignia, you see there's a little number one over the crossed rifles for the first infantry. You can see on the collar. These five button sack coats that some of the men got their pictures taken in, hopefully those didn't go to Cuba very often, very uncomfortable for that climate. And they are more or less uh, Union War surplus. And he's got a campaign hat with the first South Carolina badge on it. And a camp picture from Chickamauga. Well, that's an 1860s battle, right? Yes, it absolutely is. But uh, Chickamauga was the first national military park for the United States acquired by the National Park Service as a battlefield site. And since the government owned the big battlefield and it was a well-known battlefield, well, they used it as a training ground for the Spanish-American War. Chickamauga was remembered in the South as a tremendous Southern victory. And for that reason, the soldiers were very proud to be training there, just as they would take pride in their association with the name General Lee. And so our friend Lieutenant Cochran, with all the great stuff. This is his canteen used at that training area there. Company A, 1st South Carolina Regiment, U.S. Oh my goodness, this is a different canteen used at the same site that belonged to a man in the company named Calder. Some of you are old enough to remember Boy Scout canteens of this model. It's a pretty good canteen design. The cork there is in the top. Uh, Lieutenant Cochran's canteen is written on the side of it, Chickamauga, and they love to put that word on various stuff that they were bringing home for souvenirs. Surreptitious relic hunters at that battlefield over the years have often found themselves, to their surprise, coming up not with the Union or Confederate artifacts they intended to be sneaking out and getting, but rather with artifacts from 1898 training exercises for the Spanish-American War. 
The next image, really neat, unusual piece of gear. And I do wonder what convinced Dr. Milford to get a picture, and again, see we see the funny collar styles and so forth, um, but to get a picture, not just in the cap, but in the cap with the rain cover on it. Why did he choose to do that? Uh, and that seems to be the kind of thing that, um, uh, there has to be a story behind why he chose that. But we're so glad that he did, because we have here, An original example of the cap as issued at that time. By the way, this is one reason to visit us on Zoom as well as in person. You can't get the up close this way with original artifacts always in the gallery. Here we have Green cover for the cap. Very same thing that Dr. Milford is wearing in that rather unusual photograph. So really cool stuff. As usual, I'm very grateful to the collection department. Now, Stuart Cooner carried this, and this too may look familiar to former scouts or folks who have done camping. This is a mess kit, and he has marked it with the date, June 10th, 1898. We're recording this on June 10th, 2020. See here how the improved mess kit actually unfolds into something you can fry over the fire with. So here's Dr. Milford with his rain cover on his cap. I'm moving into a couple more original images here. These are both sort of souvenir images. Um, one taken from a training camp down in Florida. You can see they've struck a good dramatic pose here with the rifle before them. The other, this was a standard place um, up near Chickamauga to get your picture taken on this natural um, rock formation. So they're kicking back and smoking their pipes uh, and happy to send these things home to document their days in the Army. South Carolina boys will fight. And that was something that was proven in 1898 as they turned out in large numbers for this Spanish-American War with a new kind of rifle, more advanced tactics, but deliberately carrying forward the idea of valor from their fathers and the instruction that had been given by the original General Lee to his soldiers at the end of the war to go home and be as good citizens as you were soldiers and to forget your animosities and make your sons Americans. Here we have a great group picture of some members of the 1st Regiment, 1st and 2nd Reliefs on guard duty at Chickamauga Park. Uh, in this photo, they do not yet have the more advanced rifles. They're using trapdoor Springfields. And the Army was in the process of um, 
change where the rifles were concerned. The trapdoor Springfield looked a lot like the old Springfield muzzle loaders, but had been converted to fire a cartridge, but a cartridge that was filled with black powder. So the next step was to go to what they called smokeless powder and the Army's official Craig Jorgensen would take that step. Uh, however, they'd find in Cuba that they were facing uh, Mausers, which the Spanish had bought. And the Mauser was such a superior rifle that it was brought home uh, by the Army with the request to Springfield, you need to design us something a lot more like this weapon before we go to battle again. And that's a big part of the story of the Springfield 1903. Oh, here's a close up of the um, photograph that we also have on display out in the gallery. Uh, and one thing you can see from Lieutenant Cochran here, he's wearing the new khakis. He's no longer at this point in the blue uniform, uh, the blue wool uniform. So this is gonna be much more comfortable in the tropics. Uh, the blanket roll had been widely adopted. This was commonly done by Confederate troops in the previous war. Well, it was a very uh, efficient way to carry your gear and widely used in the Spanish-American War. And there is that beautiful sword, which you must come in to our physical facility to see. In training for Jacksonville, Camp Cuba Libre, and that is the uh, battle cry of the revolution, of uh, the revolutionaries in Cuba, free Cuba, Cuba Libre, uh, and thus, of course, becomes a battle cry for our folks as well. And again, you see a trapdoor Springfield featured in this training from uh, this picture from the Florida training. And this would be the first war in which casual photographs were taken by a fair number of men. So here's some men on the way to Cuba, kind of hammering it up on the boat. This fellow's got his nose guard hanging down around his neck. Hopefully he's gonna pull it back up before he goes back into playing football around camp. Some men hamming it up with their bayonets for a photo op. And one of the big things we're gonna learn from the Spanish-American War is how much more capacity the US needs in logistics. There were a lot of men ready to go. They were pretty well equipped in a hurry. And there was a bottleneck, not nearly enough transportation to get them to the theater of war in time to participate. And South Carolina's regiments that go as state militia, they're gonna wind up arriving in Cuba too late for the actual fighting, but rather be part of the occupation forces of the island. A tough and thankless and sometimes dangerous job, uh, danger both from bandits and insurgents that decided they didn't support the new government, uh, but also a much worse danger from tropical disease, a lot of danger and misery but not there in time to throw their weight behind the big battles because there weren't enough ships to get them there. Indeed, logistics were so strained that the most famous unit in the war, the Rough Riders, trained as cavalry and very fine cavalry they were by all accounts, but they were not riders at all in Cuba. There had been no room on the ship for their horses. So lessons about logistics were important in 1898, especially as we prepared to become a world power, deploying troops and having interests all around the world. And here we see some graves in Cuba of victims of tropical diseases. Those of you who didn't catch it the first time through, uh, we recently did a, a history talk. It's recorded on our webpage about uh, some South Carolina volunteers against yellow fever, whose story is a fascinating one as well. The only three names on our Spanish-American War monument. Ah, and I had a slide about them, but you can check the other lesson for that tremendous story. <laughs>
because it's getting a little bit late. Here we have the boys with a banjo in a celebratory mood coming home from the Spanish-American War. And one thing that they would do when they got home is immediately found veterans associations based on the rituals and the administrative uh, setup of the United Confederate Veterans and the Grand Army of the Republic, Union and Confederate Veterans Organizations. They would set up a national society of the uh, Spanish War veterans. Uh, we have a banner from that particular organization in the museum's collection as well. And they would be a feature of civic events for a long time to, go, to come as Americans took great pride in the success of our forces in the Spanish-American War. And as for the first time in history was proven what Norman Rockwell would, would later title one of his pieces for World War I, blue plus gray equals khaki. As the sons of the former Yankees, the sons of the former rebels, and the sons of the freed slaves came together as United States military men uh, to triumph in the battles of 1898. And my time is uh, beginning to run short here. So thank you all for coming in today. Does anybody have any questions or comments from the stuff that they saw today about South Carolinians in the Spanish American War? Uh, I mentioned at the very beginning of all of this, Matthew Colbraith Butler and his role, his old rival, Joe Wheeler, went on to get some real combat glory in the Spanish-American War. Uh, Matthew Colbraith Butler trained cavalry troopers uh, from Virginia and wound up in Cuba too late for the actual fighting. And he wrote home without regret about that. He said he had volunteered in time for the fighting. So honor was satisfied and that no real old soldier would tear his shirt off to get into a battle if he's ever seen a real one before. Uh, but he became so popular with the locals as a member of the occupation forces uh, that there was a petition circulated in Cuba to have him made the governor general of the island. Uh, that didn't happen. That honor actually wound up going to Fitzhugh Lee. But it's interesting that Matthew Colbraith Butler was a man who had profoundly resented and occasionally resisted the military occupation of South Carolina uh, during Reconstruction, and that many of the boys in the forces had grown up under Reconstruction, uh, heavily, heavily resented by their parents, and now they found themselves in a reverse role. They were the occupiers on a conquered island. And apparently Butler took a lot of initiative to uh, divert military supplies to humanitarian aid, to restore order in a way that the Cubans appreciated, uh, and made himself very popular with the occupied, which is not an easy thing for an occupying force to do, but perhaps he had an advantage. Having seen occupation from the other direction, he knew a little bit more about how they felt. 